Can we give our worship team another hand of appreciation for the work that they do? I very much appreciate them. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of the worship team, come by and see Sister Diane. And uh, especially if you play an instrument. If you want to go to heaven, you will come play at the church. So we need you. I, um, if you want to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, we're going to be looking at chapter 8 and chapter 12 in the Old Testament. While you're doing that, let me read you something from 1 Corinthians 16. says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do on the first day of the week, let each of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper. The Lord the Lord declares for us to give the tithe to Him. And I will tell you right now that when we give to God, God blesses us for that. And uh, uh, I'm, I am one, I'm a pastor that believes in tithing. My wife and I do it. We've got our, our uh, boxes back there by the door. We don't actively take up uh, an offering across here. But uh, I do want to say thank you for your giving. And I want to encourage you that when you place your finances in right alignment with God's Word, watch how God's blessings unfold in your life. It's the truth for anything, is that if you're living life faithfully before God, watch the blessings come. Because blessing from God. How many like to be blessed? All four of you. Okay, hallelujah. So for those of us that enjoy being blessed, blessing always follows faithfulness and obedience. Faithfulness and obedience. If we will be these things with God, we're going to be blessed. And one of those happens to be in our finances. That God has a way. My wife and I have seen it firsthand. Where we give our 10% to the Lord. And there's often times God says, give to that, give to that. I want you to, and, and we try to be obedient to all those things. Sometimes it's, it's a good bit more than 10%. It could be 20%, 30%. And it's amazing how God takes what's left and pays for everything that needs to be paid for. Can I get a witness on that? Somebody else know what I'm talking about? So it's amazing how when I give to God, I can't outgive God because God gives back. So in your uh, in your faithfulness in all things, let me just say thank you. Your time, your treasure, and your talents. Be faithful with those things that God has given you. To be his. I want to talk to you today about cowboys and contentment. It's kind of a good thing to talk about in church. I'm talking about cowboys on the horse because my cowboys in Dallas do not content me whatsoever. They frustrate me. I found out we're the number one most frustrated fan base in all the NFL. Because this year is going to be our year. So we're not talking about them. But I want to talk to you about the joy of right living. How do you like having joy in your life? Feel some happiness going on. I love that. I look at the news. I look at all the bad things happening. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, I need some joy. I need some joy. And God does that. God does that. Especially when we're living life the right way. I'm going to introduce you to somebody by the name of Glenn Smith. Glenn was like the rest of us. As an adult, he and his wife accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, uh, and, and then it's a matter of now what? What do you do? How do you live? Where do you go? Glenn used to be with the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. Now get this. Joined at the age of 15 in 1950. A few years back. And he lived the life of riding, ranching, rodeoing. He did all that stuff. Uh, right before he got out of the, uh, the uh, PRCA, he was, he was actually a rodeo clown and bullfighter. And uh, now he's, it's in the early 70s, 1970s, down here in Austin. He and his wife and kids are living down there. He owns a construction business doing drywall and some other things. And uh, that's his life. He wrote a book called Apostle Cowboy Style. And uh, if you're interested in Jesus and cowboy life, uh, you ought to pick up a copy of that. My Shout out to my aunt and uncle, Olin and Lola Halbert. They tend to watch this. 
And uh, when we first came here as your pastors, they stuck that thing in the mail and sent it to me. And I thought, I've pastored country people pretty much my entire career. I ain't never had to deal with many cowboys. So I was curious about that. And, uh, uh, and so I started reading this book. It's pretty interesting. Glenn describes how in search for his purpose while living for Jesus, I'm living for the Lord, but what's my purpose? What do you want me to do, God? God led him back to the rodeo. He had actually got out of the rodeo. His wife told him to get out of the rodeo. You're a husband now. You're a father now. I need you off the road and here helping us take care of our family. So he got out of the rodeo and then God started giving him visions about cowboys on the bronc, on the bull, uh, out in the arena. Suddenly they're on fire. They're going to hell. He's having these dreams, these visions. And he's like, what do I do with this? And he felt like God was leading him back to the place he left and he's scared to death to tell his wife. How many guys can relate to something like that? Maybe I, I didn't mean to buy that gun. It just accidentally happened. I, I, my car just flew. Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. So he actually, uh, Glenn Smith had gotten on the phone with his wife that uh, uh, she was out of town because how you know the best time to break the news is when she's out of arm's reach. And uh, so he broke the news to her and said, baby, I, I got to tell you, I God's calling me back to the rodeo to minister to the cowboys. And there's a moment of silence and then laughter on the other end of the phone. And he's like, well, that went a little better than I thought it would. <laughs> and she said, Glenn, I know that. God told me this six months ago, but I couldn't say anything until he told you about it. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So uh, God led him back at, as an evangelist to the rodeo world, probably one of the very first full-time rodeo evangelists that started the ministries that we get to see take place today. And uh, the life he left was where God sent him back to. The thing he left behind is what God took him back to. Finding and operating in the gifts that God gave him caused Glenn to not only... Uh, find his life purpose, but he found incredible joy at it because he was living his life right before God. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't misbehaving. He wasn't doing the things his wife doesn't approve of. But here he is serving God back in a place where he did not serve God. And God was using him to make a difference. There's a joy that comes from doing that. A joy when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Now, in our previous discussions, because what we've been dealing with is discovering our purpose for life, discovering what it is God wants you to live and do in this life, because this is probably the most, the most questioned question I ever get from people in my church. And so we talked about how God was, uh, has created everything necessary in order for you to live a life pleasing to Him. God wants you to live a pleasing life. He doesn't want to have to forgive you every time you turn around because something stupid you did. He's saying you can do this right. And He wants to help you to do it and to establish your place in eternity. So we looked at that a life filled with purpose and fulfillment looks like you love God and you love your neighbor. You know God and you make Him known to those around you. You live practicing a true religion based on serving God and serving others. So you cannot live this life without the two parts. God and your neighbor around you. You can't be a hermit. Hear me. You can't be a hermit and please God. Because God wants you to reach out to those around you. Once we saw how we are created to thrive in this life by remaining in His presence and living among His people within shifted gears towards the tools that He's given us to accomplish this. Okay, God, this is what you want. How do I do it? Well, so our guidelines for right living come out of the Word of God. He gave us that. That is 66 books written by 40 different men over a period of almost 2,000 years 
But there's only one author, and that's the Holy Spirit. God gave us His Word. Not men. God gave us His Word. Okay? Now, apart from the Word that tells us what to do, how do you know you can know what to do, but you don't do it? If you don't believe me, go home and look at your laundry hamper. Go look at your grass. I know what I need to be doing, but I ain't got the want to to do it. Mm, look at your neighbor say he's talking to you. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do what needs to be done. It's not a thing we can do on our own. If we can't say Jesus is Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit, how on earth are we going to do the work of the Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit? Because we sometimes we just seem like natural born failures. We just, boy, we start a lot of things, but we seldom finish it. Go home and look at your laundry, you know. <laughs> I saw a sign that said, laundry done in like two hours, folded, seven to ten business days, you know. So God, God gives us the guidelines through His Word. He gives us the power through His Spirit. And when all these things are operating in your life the way God created them to, here comes the joy. The joy that says, man, I'm enjoying this and I'm glad I'm doing it and I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop. So up to now, we've been identifying how to live for God. Now next week, we're going to be bringing this series to a close. And what we're going to be looking at is what do I do for God? What do I do for God? God's not calling all of you to preach behind this pulpit. <laughs> You're welcome. This is like one of the largest phobias in mankind is public speaking. I just make this look easy. I'm just, I just want you to know that. But God has something He wants you to do for His glory. And he, I want you to hear this. It's, about, it's not about your ability. It's about your availability. God did not need David. I remember the story of David and Goliath. Okay? God did not need David to kill Goliath. God needed David to throw the rock. I got a feeling. I got a feeling. He could have threw that rock over here and God would have curved that thing around and hit him broadside in the head. God has a way of making things happen the way they need to. God did not need David to kill the giant. He needed him to throw the stone. God does not need you to save the world. He needs you to stay at your post. So we have to understand that. We'll talk about that later next week. But today, God's desire for your life here is to thrive in your knowledge and relationship with Him so, so you can help your fellow man. They know less about God than you do. Or they pretend to know more than you do and they don't know squat. I get, to, okay, I won't park here just a second. I get tickled. I get tickled. Somebody wants to come up and have a theological discussion with me and they don't know come here from sickle. And I'm just like, oh, but you can't tell them nothing. You can't tell them nothing because they already know everything. I was in Arkansas and they told me, said, Brother Mike, you can always tell a Texan, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> it is what it is. Now, when you're doing right between God and those that are around you, it produces inside of you a joy and a contentment that can't be found anywhere else. Only God, that's a joy, only comes from Jesus. It's not fleeting, it's something that hangs around. Now, it's not necessarily happiness. God gives us those opportunities to experience happiness, but we've had, we've had this conversation, joy and happiness are two different things. Happiness occurs because of favorable conditions that elicit an emotional response. Everything's just right to make me happy. Well, bless your little heart. I'm glad everything just fits you right to me. We were going to happy. But how do you know that doesn't always happen? It don't always happen. If you've got kids, it don't always happen. So if you, everything's right, you can be happy. But what if everything's not right? Joy is a decision to focus on and experience a type of contented happiness regardless of situations and emotions. I have to feel happy. I choose to have joy. 
I choose to have joy. Why? Because I can't give my joy away unless I give it away. Devil can't take my peace. Come on, somebody. Devil can't take your peace. He cannot take your joy. You surrender it. You surrender it. Something bad happens? Devil, not today. Mm -mm. Not today. This is my day with Jesus. Are you hearing me? You choose your joy. I'm going to make it today. I'm going to have... Mm, me and Jesus are going to have us a good day today. I don't know about you, but there have been times I've had to turn around and walk off from somebody. That spirit of slap was fitting to come on me. That's Jesus. Help me. So joy is something that we decide. Happiness is because everything just worked out right. I can have joy when I wouldn't be happy. Okay? So let me show you that. In Ecclesiastes 8.15. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let me, let me give you a context here. If you, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, written by, we believe it was King Solomon, David's son, towards the end of his days, he started good, went bad, finished up mediocre good. Okay? And he, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is, is, is a grumpy old man at the end of his days saying, huh, it wasn't all that. It wasn't all that. Well, he says this because he's talking about in chapter 8, life is hard, things are unfair. How do you bear witness to that? Life can be hard, things can be unfair. So I recommend having fun. I love the Word of God. Hallelujah. So I recommend, he says, having fun because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That is joyful living. Okay? That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. Have you ever grown up hearing the statement, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Okay. Eat, drink, and be merry. So when, when he's saying, look at all this hard stuff, I recommend that you have some fun. Understand this. Your fun cannot separate you from God. That ain't fun. That's a trap. Okay? The things that you do to eat, drink, and, and enjoy life, now that's what we do on a Wednesday night here in the house of God. Hallelujah. Tacos and nachos. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to eat, we're going to drink, and we're going to enjoy life with one another. Okay? Because life can be tough. Savor the moments. Value the moments. Because life can be hard. So we, we understand we can have joyful living in the midst of the hard times. He goes on in chapter 12, the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes. The last two verses, he says this. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. Are you seeing that? This is what everybody's supposed to be doing. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. As you serve God, joyfully live. Joyfully live. In the midst of all of it, find Him. Now, let me shift gears here just a second. Let me tell you a little bit about my story. So growing up down here in Florence, 100 years ago, I was running from my calling because God had called me to pastor and I did not want to do it. And I ran from that calling hard. My rebellion was not because I didn't love God. I loved God. Matter of fact, I was miserable in my rebellion because I loved God. I just didn't want to be a preacher because I didn't like how preachers had to live. I didn't like how people treated preachers. I didn't like that they all looked poor, drove shabby cars, I'm glad y'all look at the guys on TV. Come down to the real world. Okay. I didn't like thinking I had to go into a career that did not value ministers. What do you do for a living? 
I pastor a church. Oh. What's your day job? I ain't even going to go there except to say God called the pastor to pastor. Go back to the 12 tribes of Israel. Set aside Levi for me. Why? I don't want him worrying about the crops. I don't want him worrying about the army. I don't want him worried about anything else. I want the priesthood dedicated to me for your sake. Brother Mark, I need to meet with you. Well, I got to plow my garden. I've got to do this. I got to do that. I got to. You need your pastor there. You need somebody that's living to show you God. I didn't want to be a part of that stuff. Fear, discontentment. I didn't want to. Finally, I surrendered. I am hard headed, but not that much. Because I realized I was miserable. So I surrendered to the call. My senior year of high school, I said, this is it. I'm, I'm yours, Jesus. Get me out of here. So I left for Bible college. In over 35 years of ministry, my wife and I have served in roughly 12 churches as either a youth pastor, associate pastor, or the lead pastor of a church. In that time that we have served, we've also had positions we were in the assemblies of God and so the assemblies of God they break down what they call districts like Arkansas is its own district Louisiana is its own district Texas Florida and California are so big they break them down into three Texas just got too much in it and uh, so uh, I have served in the assemblies of God uh, uh, in in the, the district, the big part, I've served in offices there. When they break them down into multi-counties, uh, what we call sections, multi-counties, five, six, seven counties all clumped together. Uh, my wife and I have been in charge of ministries there. from At one point from Plano, Texas, north of Dallas, all the way to Oklahoma. I oversaw all the youth ministries for that area. From uh, We lived here from... Lampasas, if you take the highway all the way around and then up to Waco, there's like 30 Assembly of God churches. I was over the youth ministries for all that. Over the men's ministries for the state of Arkansas. There's different times that we did. Now hang with me. I'm not just tooting my horn. Okay. But these were parts of boards, commissions. I even had a political office one time. Yeah. City councilman, you know my story. I've been a fireman. I've, I've been, a, uh, been a deputy. I was a city councilman. Uh, worked with Arkansas Game and Fish, Hunter's Education, teaching people how to, how to hunt. That's an experience with hillbillies. I'm just saying right now. Don't do that no more. <laughs> well, what was interesting is I'm in the middle. I tell you all that. Here's my life. I'm in the middle of God's will doing all these things and I'm not happy. Are you hearing me? Overseeing large portions, pastoring good churches, doing the work. This is what God called me to do and I'm not happy. This is a little bit of a different twist today for this, this thing. I lived in a frustration and a discontentment with no joy. While God was doing good ministry through us and God was leading us and my life purpose was being fulfilled, I lacked a joy. I'm a pastor. I'm a leader. And I have no joy. There's a reason for it. The focus was on me. The focus was on me. Because I would, I would feel like I need to do better. It wasn't, it wasn't a matter of arrogance at all. Matter of fact, it was, this ain't good enough for me. Not look at where I'm at. It's like, I need to be doing better. God, why can't I get those churches? God, why can't I have that office? Why can't I do these things? Is somebody hearing me? It was selfishness on my part. And that's why I couldn't be happy. I'm in the middle of the will of God and I'm miserable. Because the focus was on me. 
And I, and I had no idea that there was actually people who envied me. Had a couple different occasions where somebody looked at me and I'm, I'm miserable. I'm frustrated. They look at me and say, man, I wish I was you. <laughs> what? you got to be kidding me. No, I wish I had that opportunity. I wish I had your church. I wish I had this. Even have one guy said, he didn't say I wish your wife was my wife. He said, he said, I wish my wife was like your wife. He said, pastoring a church, my wife doesn't love me anymore. And she won't go to church with me, but we stay together for the kids. Pastoring a church and having to live that way. And I sat there thinking, Lord, help me. Listen, joy and contentment cannot come through a life focused on negativity. Are you hearing me? If all you're going to do is look at things like a sourpuss, you're not going to have no joy. Why? Because you ain't happy. Ain't nothing going to make you happy because the moment something can make you happy, you're going to find something wrong with it. That's what I was doing. Hallelujah. Thank you God for finally showing me that. And if you're bent on being negative, I'm telling you, you're not going to find joy because you're too busy looking for what's wrong. God can pour out His blessings on you. He can give you everything you've ever wanted and you're still not happy because you're in the way. Hallelujah. That just felt good saying it. Even if they're not going to shout with me, Diana. Joy comes out of surrender, not success. It comes out of your surrender. Lord, whatever it is you want, that's what I want. Whatever you're doing, that's what I want. Not your success. Because you, you're not a success. God's a success through you. Oh, come on. If anything flops in this church, I'll take responsibility for that. But if something good happens in my ministry, that's Jesus. And I know that. Surrender allows God to do things His way and I get to be a part of the process. You get to be a part of the process. Even a part of the hard processes that were painful at first but led to great blessings otherwise. Well, I didn't enjoy going through it. No, but you're better off because of it. Let me show you. Hebrews chapter 12. Paul says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses... To the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy. Somebody say joy. joy. Because of the joy that awaited Him. It's not here yet. But for the joy that awaited Him, He endured. What is that? He surrendered to the cross, disregarding its shame, and now He is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility He endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up when you face the same things. It was for the joy. It wasn't a joy being on that cross. Come on, somebody. I had, I had a root canal. There was no joy in the root canal. They advertised falsely, pain-free root canals on the billboard, by the highway. I hope none of y'all worked there. <laughs> and I went in and I told them, I want that pain-free one. Three hours later, And how much worse was the cross than the root canal? Amen. Moving back to Florence and Colleen for my wife and I. And being immersed in country and cowboy culture was the last thing I wanted. When I left Florence, Texas in 1990, I put my Justin Ropers, because that's what we wore back in the day. I, th I, I threw them in the back of the closet. Took my old resistor hat threw it in the back of the closet. Bought me boat shoes, and khaki pants, golf shirts, all the things that 
you know, you don't wear on the farm. And it was, I'll tell you right now, moving back here was the last thing I wanted to do. Do what? My mic quit. You're not that lucky. She said I died. I said no. <laughs> there was one time I had three life insurance policies on me, and I, I was like, "Hey, if something happens to me, investigate, investigate." <laughs> Let me wrap this up. Coming here was the last thing I wanted to do. Coming back to Florence. Coming back to Colleen. Can I tell you, this is the most satisfying thing my wife and I have ever done in all of our years of ministry. There's no other place we'd rather be. We love this. Why? We're in the middle of God's will. And when you're in the middle of God's will, man, you'll go buy some more boots. Which actually, I had gone to Boots a few years back because I got too fat to tie my shoes. <laughs> it's a thing. But I listen to me. Your purpose in life is not accomplished because of your skills and abilities. Joy and contentment in life come through being available for God to use you. You sow the seeds of God and let the harvest be His. It's not about a success. Success to God isn't about accomplishments, but it's about your faithfulness. Right. Your faithfulness to Him. Are you not happy with life? Let me just ask this. Are you not happy with your life? Is there no contentment in your life? I will tell you, you're doing it wrong then. Because Jesus said, I came that you may have life, and life more abundantly. A contented life. So let me help you real quick with this. First of all, if you're not content with your life, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Well, I've already done that. Great. If you haven't, that's where it starts. The second thing is you give all your failings to Him and you walk away from it. Jesus, it says, cast your sin into that sea of forgetfulness. It's as far from the east as from the west. When you come to God with your sin that you've already confessed, God suddenly has a case of amnesia. And He said, I got no clue what you're talking about. Thank God for forgetful God. Because the devil has a long memory. And he will remind you of everything that you've done wrong. You need to stop that. Walk away from it. Third, you need to allow God in your church family to help you live the right way. If you haven't heard the previous parts of this series, go back on YouTube and find it. God wants you to have a good life and we want you to have a good life in God. Because I'll tell you, we're better when we are together. Fourth, you need to crucify your selfishness and live to help others. Your selfishness is never satisfied. Moment you say, I got to have me a boat. You buy a boat, you'll have it for a moment. You'll see somebody with a bigger boat, better boat. Suddenly I'm not content with this boat. I got to get a better boat. Now I got to get a better truck to pull this better boat. And then I look at my old wife and think, hmm. Come on, somebody. You live in this world too. You see them do it. Not me. I'm scared to die. I fear God and my wife and not necessarily in that order. But our selfishness is never satisfied. That's why you got to check that thing. Live the life God wants you to have. Be grateful for what He brings to your hand. Because I tell you, the more you live with that open hand, God can put in there. He may take away, but anything God takes out of your life, He replaces with something better. Crucify that selfishness. And then fifth, find the joy of living grateful, thankful, and blessed. I'm happy. Quit looking at that. What's next? What could be? Oh, my aches and pains. All this, all that. Man, you need to be grateful for the life you got. Because the moment you think your life is bad, why don't you go with me on a missions trip and I'll show you what bad living looks like. 
the poor of America could go on a trip to see what the poor of the world looks like. You got a good life. You just may not realize it yet. Do we go through hard times? Yes, we do. Do we encounter stuff that ain't fun? Yes, we do. But God has a way of even taking the hard times of our life and helping us to have a smile on our faces and say, man, my life is good and God is good. Amen. Bow your heads with me. You may be here today and you say, Brother Mike, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Well, that's where you start. I haven't been living for the Lord. Well, you need to. You need to. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to invite you, first of all, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, to know Him. I want to lead you in a, in a prayer. And I'm just curious, are you here today? Nobody's looking around, but if I could pray with you, can you just slip up your hand and put it back down? I want to know who I'm praying for today. Is there somebody here? You would say, Brother Mike, I need Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. God is good. And I'll tell you, He loves you. He'll love you more than you'll ever love Him. He will. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Pray it and mean it because it'll change your life. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I surrender myself to You. I am sorry for the mess I've made. But today I choose You. I confess You as my Savior and Lord. I welcome You into my heart to be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to forgive myself. I love You, Lord. Help me to know You. Help me to love You. I give You the thanks today. Jesus name Father God I pray right now that for those that prayed that prayer Lord let it be something that sinks deep in their spirit Lord I don't want them just to know they prayed a prayer I want them to feel the presence of God in their life I want them to feel the change of a new attitude that comes with salvation and so Father I pray right now that you would move in that heart and that life today and that Father secondly I want to pray for those that are going through the life of discontentment. That Father, joy can be theirs, but something's in the way. Lord, we pray right now, get the things out of our way that are preventing us from having the best life we can. Forgive us of our sins. Lead us away from selfishness. Help us to be the people of God that we need to be for you. Father, I pray that you would help us as a church to help one another, to love one another, to make sure that nobody's struggling because we're all in this together. Help this to be a place, Lord God, where people can come and find freedom, find liberty, find purpose, find joy. Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you, Lord, for how you lead us, how you keep us, how you guard us. And Father, I just pray right now have your good and perfect way in our life. Lead us today to have a great day. And Lord, go before us this week so that, Father, we're finding joy in our week. We're finding you in our week. And we're finding ways to touch people's lives this week. God, we want to give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer of salvation, I want to tell you this. You've just become a part of a great family. And we want to help you with that. If you need a Bible, you need to come see me. As a matter of fact, we want to encourage you to be baptized. We want to encourage you to be a part of a good church home. If you've got a church you normally go to, go and be faithful to it. If you don't have one, I kind of recommend this one right here. I'm a little partial, I understand. But I like this place. But you need, you need to let somebody know that you prayed that prayer. Because you don't need to be doing this alone. Come find me out there in the foyer. Let me know. And I want to tell you, I'll be here for you as your pastor. 
if you let me. Stand to me. Stand with me on your feet. Don't forget all the things we got going on this week in your bulletins at uh, tacos and nachos. Hallelujah! This coming Wednesday and uh, game night, quilting, all the other things we got going on. I'm going to ask brother brother Craig Wagner, would you close us in a word of prayer, sir?